um, in particular. And as you can see, people are reporting lack of sanitation and hygiene materials, inadequate medical care, um, retaliation to organizing, um, and more. So right here in Georgia, we have four detention centers. Um, the closest one to Atlanta is in Lovejoy, Georgia, called Dayton Detention Center. Um, it is the newest one, so we were able, after years and years of really hard work, um, our organization sought to end the contract between Atlanta and ICE. So we were finally able to end detention of immigrants at the Atlanta jail, and we're now pushing um, to shut down the jail altogether. Um, but after that contract ended, the one was beaten. Um, so our fight always continues. Um, the next one is Stewart Detention Center in South Georgia in Lumpkin. Um, I believe it is the second or third largest <coughs> country. Um, then we have Irwin Detention Center in Osceola, Georgia, um, that has both men and women. And then we have Folkston Ice Processing Center right in um, the border between Georgia and Florida. I want to note that all four detention centers in Georgia are privately owned. Um, so Dayton and Folkston are owned by GEO Group, um, which is a private prison company. Stewart Detention Center is run by Core Civic, another private prison company. And Irwin is run by LaSalle Corporations, another private prison company. Um, and that's important to note because over 70% of immigrants who are detained are detained in a private facility. So as you can imagine, there are a wide range of human rights abuses happening inside of these immigration detention centers. The picture on the left is in front of the Atlanta jail um, back in 2018, and the picture on the right is in front of the Stewart Detention Center a few years ago, um, Project South um, and Penn Law. Um, clinic and many others, including um, Georgia Detention Watch, LaGuar, um, were involved in putting together reports. Um, so the first one we wrote was in 2017 on the human rights violations happening at Stewart and Irwin Detention Center. And then we did another report on the Atlanta jail and the abuses happening there. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about kind of the violations we're seeing, right? So the 2017 report on both Stewart and Irwin included documented instances of sexual assault, um, a lack of edible food with reports of worms and um, ants inside of their food, um, obviously leading to malnourishment and a lot of weight loss. Um, abuse of solitary confinement where immigrants are kept um, in a small cell for um, 23 hours a day for weeks on end as punishment for a little violation or more than likely not, um, no violation at all. Um, there are massive reports of lack of medical and mental health care. Um, We've heard from several individuals with HIV and breast cancer that they do not receive their medication on weeks on end. Um, there's also reports of not being able to see a medical professional at all for weeks on end. Um, many, many people I've interviewed and talked to have told me that they've given up on, you know, putting in a request. Um, so the way it works is that you can either wake up at four or five in the morning to put in your name for a sick call, which is what they call kind of a list to see a doctor, or you can file um, a written request to see a medical professional, excuse me, a professional 
or um, you can tell an officer. And so many people I've talked to have said they've written a request over and over and over, often more than five times, and it's been weeks and they just don't see anyone. So they've given up. So there's just a lot of medical um, neglect happening in these facilities. And unfortunately for the people who finally do get to go see a medical professional, they're often told to drink water or are given painkillers for really serious medical problems. Um, and all of this, of course, has gotten a lot worse in light of COVID-19, um, particularly at Stewart Detention Center, where we're getting calls over and over that entire units of individuals are be are sick, and you know, with COVID-like symptoms, they have um, flu-like symptoms and have chills um, and and a fever, and yet they are not receiving proper medical attention. Um, in addition to that, there are issues with forced labor at Stewart Detention Center, so Project South, um, the Southern. Poverty Law Center, the Law Office of Andrew Free, and others are part of an ongoing uh, class action lawsuit against CoreCivic, um, who owns and operates the, um, the Stewart Detention Center for essentially forcing immigrants to work for as little as a dollar to four dollars a day, if any payment at all. Um, and it's simply to afford um, bare essentials from a commissary. Um, and individuals who say they don't want to work are threatened with solitary confinement um, or get their phone cards taken away, meaning they have they can't interact with any of their loved ones anymore or contact anyone on the outside. Um, so that is an ongoing issue. Um, and um, another issue that we've seen over and over is the use of force um, by officers um, at particularly Stewart, but really all of the detention centers. So when immigrants organize and advocate for themselves um, by doing a hunger strike or a protest or simply, you know, writing a sign that says liberation on it, they are met with violence over and over. So I remember um, plenty, um, sorry, excuse me, September of last year, I remember getting calls um, and, and interviewing people who mentioned that there were a group of individuals who were peacefully protesting um, outside in the yard um, who, who are detained immigrants and they were not doing anything. They were outside during their recreation time, and they held up signs that said freedom and liberation. And the next day, they were met with heavy violence. Um, the guards and, and officials responded with shooting at them with rubber bullets. Um, they, they tear gassed and pepper sprayed them, and then they put them in solitary confinement for a month, if not more or they transferred or deported them immediately. And this is nothing new. We've heard this over and over and over. In fact, this happened again a few weeks ago when in light of COVID-19, um, immigrants um, obviously have been really concerned about their health and well-being um, and, and decided to say something about it and again, protest. And they were again met with being shot at with rubber bullets and pepper sprayed, and again, were put into solitary confinement. And unfortunately, there have been um, a lot of deaths in detention as well. Um, five individuals have died at Stewart Detention Center alone in the last few years. Um, and in fact, unfortunately and tragically, um, Mr. Santiago Onslag died about two weeks ago at Stewart Detention Center from COVID-related complications. Um, and I would like to talk about some of them, um, particularly at Stewart. Um, so Pedro Ariago Santoya died in 2019. 
from cardiac arrest. Um, Julio Castro Jarizo died in 2018 from pneumonia. Um, Efrain Romero de la Rosa died in 2018 by suicide after 21 days in solitary confinement. Um, and Jean Carlos Jimenez Joseph died in 2017 by suicide after 19 days in solitary confinement. Um, Mr. Joseph had a clear history of mental health concerns. In fact, he repeatedly told the staff over and over and over that he needed a stronger dosage of medication, that the medication he was on was not working for him. And yet, Stewart Detention Center did not have a single psychiatrist, um, a full-time single psychiatrist there. So all the immigrants had to rely on a video conferencing a system to see a psychiatrist. And obviously, there were three to four month backlog. So the day before, Mr. Um, Joseph was going to see finally a psychiatrist because no one else would do anything and they made him wait. Um, a day before his appointment, he died by suicide. Um, and so these are, again, the type of issues that we are seeing at these detention centers. Um, and again, in light of COVID-19, things are a lot more heightened. Things are, um, people are scared for their lives. Um, and so I do want to read and uplift some of the messages we're hearing from inside detention. Um, so this one um, individual said, please, we are scared here. We cannot keep the distance of two meters that is called for. All of us are placed together. We are 76 people in every section. There does not exist a way to be able to avoid an outbreak. Please, we ask for help from everyone. We are human beings. We also need to be with our families to be able to help them. Another individual said, if one person were to get infected, we will all get infected and there are thousands of us. At this moment, um, as of today, ICE is reporting that there are 26 immigrants with COVID at Stewart, seven at Irwin, and four at Folkston. Um, we know that these are gross underestimates because we know that they're not testing everyone that needs to be tested. I also want to note, ICE is not reporting this, but um, Core Civic um is reporting it um and reporters have asked core civic over and over um about the employees who work at stewart and as of may 20th um over 53 employees at stewart detention center had tested positive um so that's that's huge and and horrible um i also want to share a message from Irwin Detention Center. Um, I'm going to try to play it now, so bear with me. Um, Nosotros necesitamos protección, por favor. Nosotros lo único que queremos es que se ponga la mano en la conciencia, en el corazón, porque somos tantas madres que estamos en este lugar sufriendo tantas cosas, humillaciones, por el amor de Dios, porque ahí no puede entender que tenemos que estar más de un año para poder tener una corte, Dios santo, porque no entienden. Aquí estamos sufriendo humillaciones, aquí no tenemos protección, los oficiales entran, salen, vienen sin protección, estamos asustadas por Dios, estamos asustadas, necesitamos ayuda por nuestros hijos, tenemos que salir vivas de este lugar, ya no más, por favor, pónganse las manos en la conciencia. 
videos con miedo de que tomen represalias contra nosotros, que nos aíslen, que nos corten la comunicación con la familia. Obviously, a very disturbing, disturbing video and, and powerful organizing from inside, from people who are detained every day, whether it's through a protest where they're being videotaped um, when they conference in someone um, or uh, a hunger strike or what have you. People are fighting um, for their lives inside uh, detention. Um, I highly, highly recommend everyone watch the entire video. Um, it's very powerful and really gives you an idea of what it's like um, being detained, in, especially in light of COVID-19. Um, you know, they talked about being afraid that they might be put in solitary confinement. That's exactly what happened. These women were retaliated against Irwin Detention Center, did not like that they organized and that they contacted reporters and that they stood up for themselves. And these women were put in solitary confinement for, for weeks on end. Um, so that just again shows what the situation is like right now. Um, our organizations have been fighting for years and years to, to shut down these facilities altogether. We do not believe um, that people should be detained or, or incarcerated. Um, we don't believe the carceral system is the answer for issues that uh, our society is facing. So. I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the advocacy efforts we've done, and then I'll pass it to Adelina. Um, many organizations, including GLAR, have written over and over and over to ICE, demanding them to release immigrants on the basis of humanitarian parole, which they have the ability to do, and they haven't. Um, and in light of that, Project South, along with 50 other organizations, wrote a letter to um, congressional leaders in Georgia urging them to talk to ICE and urging them to demand ICE release immigrants from these detention centers. Um, since our letter, Representative Johnson signed on to a letter to ICE urging them to release medically vulnerable individuals in ICE custody. And just recently actually also submitted his own request to ICE, um, demanding that they ask or answer vital um, questions like how are they actually protecting immigrants from COVID and what they're doing about this constant violence from their officers um, at Stewart Detention Center, and a lot of the language he used was taken directly from our advocacy efforts. Um, in, in addition, we're in constant communication with congressional leaders, making sure that they're educated and aware of what's happening on the ground. Um, Project South, in conjunction with the Penn State Law Clinic and Detention Watch Network, recently submitted a request to the United Nations Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, demanding an investigation into the abuses happening at Stewart Detention Center. Um, again, you know, we're movement lawyers. While we do think um, litigation is one tool that's not the end-all be-all, um, so we are involved in the forced labor lawsuit, and we often um, represent individual families um, of individuals who have died in detention. But, you know, we're also, um, it's equally important, if not more, to do grassroots organizing um, and coalition building. And so we're part of Georgia Detention Watch, um, that GLAR is part of this as well. And we've done a lot of grassroots organizing through Georgia Detention Watch and local advocacy. Um, and all we've done several caravans, and I'll let Adelina talk a little bit more about that. 
I thank you, Priyanka. Um, yes, uh, I think that has been a, a, a real struggle for many years. I think that uh, what Priyanka mentioned to you is is just a part of this the problem that we many communities at large are facing every single day. Um, and a, many years ago, when we um, began to work on the organizing part, the community organizing, um, we were thinking kind of uh, to go into different levels uh, in terms how are we going to protect ourselves and how we can move into the offensive as well as, as at the same time. Um, in one hand, we have the uh, community, the grassroots community organizing, and the other hand, we do have the um, the coalition building, the support that we have built through many years with uh, Project South, Georgia Detention Watch, and other groups as well. Tong, part of the uh, efforts to deter, to uh, to push back. Um, all uh, whatever is going on in our communities that are affect, affecting not only immigrants because uh, and not only Latinos, many immigrants and refugees as well have been affected with this policy change. Um, uh, during, for example, uh, we saw uh, in last in the past years, for example, in 2007, the implementation of the 287G program. Uh, here in uh, in the state of Georgia, right now we have two uh, five uh, counties with the 287G, uh, which is the program that um, that uh, uh, deputize uh, police officers as ICE agents, uh, and the concern with that is that our community, um, if it's detained under a minor traffic violation. Uh, they are uh, being arrested and, uh, of course, processed for deportation. Um, <clears throat> but also, not only the 287G, which is like a federal program, but also we do have these anti-immigrant bills that <clears throat> they were passing in this um, in this context of uh, a, with the a, of changing the perspective of immig immigrants here in the state of, and, and, why, uh, and nationwide as well. Meaning that we have bills like the SB 350, that is the web, that this bill was passed in July 2018 and says that, for example, if you are uh, undocumented and you are stopped under a minor traffic violation, you will be um, two things. Put in jail, you were going to be arrested, but as well, you were going to pay the first offense, $500 to $1,000 for not having a driver's license. And the second offense, more money, more jail. Third offense, more money, more, more jail. But as well, the fourth offense, they were going to call eyes on the person that has been arrested. Um, and all this uh, combination of federal programs or anti-immigrant bills that have created this deportation pipeline that see uh, immigrants, uh, a black and brown, uh, to this uh, deportation machine, uh, to this uh, a deportation or detention centers uh, uh, here in Georgia and nationwide. Uh, with the 287 g the increase on racial profiling, the increase on um, the, the anti-immigrant bills, like the one, the SB350, the, the increase of the um, the anti-sanctuary bill that uh, was very famous, uh, HB 87, another um, another show me your papers bill, kind of the uh, copycat of the uh, SB 1070 in 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 in, um, in, Ari in Arizona, or bills like uh, English only that they have been continue uh, pushing and putting. For discussion, for more, I, I I do believe that almost 20 years, every single year we have the English only bill uh, to to close the opportunities for uh, immigrant communities and refugee communities, kind of the uh, to be pushed to uh, to learn English and um, do not uh, that stop the preservation of their culture as well. Um, that part of for us has been like a, the struggle to fight back against the 287G program. Just to let, let give you 
uh, a little bit of numbers. Uh, from 2007 to uh, 2013, uh, and that's, this is a study that we, with Project South and other uh, friends, we were able to, uh, to produce. Uh, more than 76,000 people uh, was arrested, and uh, out of those 76,000, more than 50,000 were processed for deportation, uh, mostly Latinos, uh, immigrant community. And the concern that we as well had at the time, and still have because this is happening, is that more than 40,000 children, which are U.S. citizens, are left with a parent or both parents because they have been processed for deportation. That's, that's um, kind of a huge concern that uh, of the impact that gives you an idea how deeply this is affecting and impacting communities at large. And, and in particular, uh, um, all these people that have been arrested were arrested uh, mostly under the 287G program. Um, and all these numbers that I just gave you, these are numbers that uh, uh, were produced by, we wanted to know at the beginning uh, uh, how many police, local law enforcement uh, were working or participating with ICE. And that's kind of the result of these numbers uh, that uh, we obtained. Uh, and we knew what police, uh, what local law enforcement, could be the county, could be the city, uh, uh, that were participating and, and putting these uh, community members into this deportation pipeline. At the same time, uh, part of the, the work that we have been doing is to ex uh, empower our uh, community uh, at the grassroots level. We see this kind of this combination of the community lawyering, uh, advocacy, social justice, and at the same time put it together with the uh, grassroots community organizing as uh, a, another way to push back and having more strength in, in, te in terms of um, our impact to repeal or to push back different organizations. And our work has been for many years with Project South Song and participating as well with a lot of impact, uh, impact litigation as a tactic to, uh, to get to know what is going on and allow us as a res uh, that has allowed us to, as a result to push back in different levels and at least to expose what is going on in communities. Um, many of our, um, our efforts um, have been directed to how are we going to uh, continue building uh, community power and support this uh, coalition building at the same time. But in 2016, uh, we were faced with the uh, issue that uh, we were thinking that everything at the national level was closed and everything. We were not able to push for any any kind of relief. So we thought that our national strategy was going to be our local strategy. So all our effort has been directed to this, um, to the ground. To the ground meaning to push back uh, whatever, uh, uh, not whatever, but ICE efforts to arrest people on the streets. Um, because at the same time, uh, we thought that we felt that we have the federal government against us but in particular, the White House, the Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security. So we were facing to a situation that uh, this uh, systemic um, violence against uh, immigrants and refugees at large. Um, what we, part of this problem is the, what we see now in the streets of Black Lives Matter. And that's the most important part for us was to define what are we going to do if ICE is showing up. And we, con we uh, began to promote this campaign called Ice Free Zone. The Ice Free Zone campaign, it is kind of, uh, the idea is coming from the traditional know your rights. But the difference for us was that because our community members are, commu are uh, new immigrants in this part of the United States, Mostly they speak Spanish. They uh, eh, so we needed something based on uh, popular education that helped us and helped them 
as well and all together to understand what is what we have to do in case ice show up in my house or is waiting outside on the streets. And we create these cards that at this point since 2016, we have been able to pass to uh, directly face-to-face -face community meetings to community members as well, more than 25,000 uh, of these cards. These cards, uh, and the other part of this is that we ask the community members to put that card uh, inside their house. So if I show up, so you can just turn the information uh, uh, and show it to the ICE agent uh, from the window, uh, from your door if you want, uh, but don't open the door. Maybe uh, we don't want to this is nothing new, uh, but the idea for us was more important to, to create this culture of resistance. Uh, like a, as much people to get to know and to defend because we believe that at this time, um, a, just a couple of organizations moving and pushing back was not going to be the solution as long as the community uh, help us. And that was the effort for almost uh, three years, four years now visiting community members, apartments, uh, trailer parks. We show up in events, in grocery stores, just moving this machine of creating the, the resistance against. And so far, uh, a, a, the, the resistance uh, uh, have shown, uh, as ICE is complaining that uh, many of uh, organizations are blocking or obstructing their their work. But yes, 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 we are. and this. Uh, what I think that this is the most important campaign um, to put it out uh, in one hand, asking the community members to give the voice to their family members about their, their rights. Um, I, it's no way that only GLAR or Project South are able to do so unless they are doing um, a, by themselves as well to uh, grow, to grow the, mom, the, the, the movement as well of this culture of resistance. Part of this uh, campaign, uh, we have uh, the uh, initiative of uh, these ICE chasers. The ICE chasers are uh, it's a group of people, volunteer, allies, uh, fake groups that want to join us to work as a rapid response team. The ones that in case we hear that ICE is around in the neighborhood, these people go uh, to document, to be kind of observers of of any kind of violation of the rights of, of our community members. And um, this is kind of a, trying to expand these efforts, not only thinking not only in Latinos, but also if we are able to kick out eyes and the police of our communities, we are able as well to contribute to diminish violence in our communities. For us, uh, this is uh, really important. And um, at the end, 2016, we continue. Uh, the federal uh, policies are coming down heavy, very heavy, uh, and we are continue building this cultural resistance, uh, hoping that uh, we we see a change in the following months. And uh, another actions together uh, to push back. We have had the ICE Reason campaign, the ICE Chasers, but also the N-287G campaign that required to push back all these sheriffs to uh, terminate the 287G. And the other also muy, very important is about the caravans. This in the, in the COVID times, we, uh, we know how important it is. And we have these caravans that we have organized together with different groups uh, trying to call the attention and to expose whatever is going on, exact the violations of a, a, inside the Irwin Detention Center, as you saw, the call for help, and that that very uh, strong video uh, is what we have to do something. We have to, you know, move the message, um, and exactly is what we do. Is it did uh, was uh, organized this caravan in um, Osceola, Georgia, which is where the Irwin Detention Center is, and embrace the demands as well, the freedom of, uh, as part of our, our own campaign, looking not to freedom only uh, immigrants of Latinos, 
that are in detention centers but open, you know, wide, uh, make wider our demand uh, in solidarity with other um, uh, communities of color that are facing these problems uh, with the uh, uh, state police and uh, state violence. That would be it, um, Priyanka. Perfect. Thank you, Adelina, so much. Let me stop sharing my screen. All right, awesome. I'll pass it back to Shelly if we have any questions. Yeah, so um, folks, if you want to um, type a question out in the chat or you can go on unmute as well um, and ask our, our presenters any questions that you have about the work that they're doing or uh, any topics that they presented on. I can, I have a question just for you guys um, doing this work. You know, at Tahare, um, we do at, at times represent detained folks. Recently, we represented, uh, we're still representing him, um, but we had a detained immigrant um, who was in Folkestone and he had been denied bond um, multiple times um, without really clear justification as to why. No criminal history, no flight risk. He was a, a Cuban asylee who came here as a gay man with his partner to get married and to live an open uh, life as, as a gay man. Um, and it honestly took Tahere you know, 50 days, I think, of writing letters to ICE, figuring out who had the authority for adjudication. I mean, it took him having an attorney, having an organization like Tahere representing him. Um, and, you know, we were calling every day, we were emailing every day, and finally we figured out who the officer was. Um, and ultimately, it wasn't because he came at... Um, at a un unrecognized port of entry, um, the the ICE officer said that there were like five exceptions under the INA where he could be released. One of them being medical, um, and like you were talking about with healthcare issues. I mean, he was suffering from kidney stones. The the nurse gave him ibuprofen for kidney stones and was like, "They'll pass." Um, and he suffered a significant amount of anxiety and depression that became onset in detention because of his anxiety about being sexually abused due to his sexual orientation. And we had documentation of that. And I think that's ultimately what got him out. But that's what it's taking, right? It's taking for one person, a lawyer or an advocate. I mean, how how is that? I mean, you know, Triple AJ and SPLC are suing in the Southern District and Middle District for vulnerable immigrants um, that have underlying conditions. Um, that could make them vulnerable to COVID. And, the, and those judges in those two districts were like, I think I can do enough to keep them safe. I mean, what is this battle looking like in this moment for us, especially with COVID-19? Adelina, do you want to take it? You, please. Okay. Um, well, Shelly, like you said, it has been an uphill battle. I mean, it has always been an uphill battle, especially with this administration, but it has just been tireless work over and over and over. And like you said, it takes a multitude of, of strategies. It, you know, okay. mitigation isn't the end all be all, calling over and over and over and calling your representatives and calling ICE and, you know, um, doing complaint after complaint to um, the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, it, it seems like, you know, it's been difficult. It seems like nothing, um, not one strategy is working, so we need all of them. That makes, yeah. And we have that's seen, that's if you allow me, Shelley, uh, yeah. if we have seen for many years, it's since 2016, it's like a, you can imagine all the doors are closed, right. no? So it's almost you have to kick, kick down the door, no, for that door to open. Um, it's, it, because um, there was a, a many years before the, the opportunity to do more advocacy emails and people were uh, coming out. 
Um, we see the numbers about the asylum cases, no, are being reduced like uh, two, two or four, no, among the 90 cases that are denied. And that's part of the, the policy. And it's, um, it has been more difficult and more difficult to push back. That's the reason for us. It's so important to uh, to create this cultural resistance. So uh, avoiding the police or avoiding being arrested for deportation since the ground, uh, from the ground. Um, uh, but I, this is this is happening um, because it's not opening at the federal level. They are closing doors and um, and sometimes when, as you mentioned, the case of this Cuban. But it's one, but it's one is a victory and and very good. Congratulations. Thank you. We have to still work on his uh, appeal. Uh, he was pro se, as you mentioned, on his asylum case, and yeah. the judge denied it, even though his husband uh, was in York, Pennsylvania, and won pro se, and they have identical cases. So that just tells you what it's like down here yeah. in Georgia. I wanted to, um, if, if anyone doesn't, I mean, I, I'm happy to take more questions, but um, if, you know, folks want to chime in, but as we're waiting for folks, I mean, you know, we're in this in really <clears throat> important moment in, in civil, uh, civil rights and, <clears throat> and racial justice. And we, we're talking about Black Lives Matter and white supremacy. I mean, can you both talk about the the nexus of white supremacy and the treatment of immigrants in this moment. I'm going to let Adelina take that. Okay. Of course, uh, um, concern, concern with this state of violence and how the white supremacy uh, is prevalent in all the uh, arenas versus uh, discrediting or impacting uh, communities of color. I think that our uh, obligation, and I don't know if obligation is a word in English. Uh, no, see? Okay. Um, now, because I'm kind of confused with the Spanish sometimes, but uh, it's an obligation, it's a moral obligation to uh, participate, pushing back all these policies. I think that if we can make some advances, the benefit is going to be for all of us. Uh, and I know that in many ways for us, me but personal as a, a, as a Latina, as a new immigrant here in the state of Georgia, uh, has been a, a huge impact on how the, is the, the society is being fragmented, uh, divided, you know, uh, and how we see this uh, a centrist uh, approach of, uh, a, of the white supremacy uh, is that worth it, the only one, uh, because the others are not even a race, they are, those brown people are ethnics, they are ethnics, no? I don't know what exactly that means. Uh, but it's, it has been a, a, const, a constant battle. We have seen the abuses, the presence of uh, even KKK or the groups of the neo-Nazis around. Uh, even uh, they have demonstrated against us here outside at the offices. Uh, we have been the we have seen the uh, race racing, the appearance of the KKK uh, at, the, at the capital or in different parts of the of the uh, South Georgia, deep south. And how that, uh, eh, for us, to be very honest, uh, in many ways, and I don't want to to um, to offend anyone, but I, I can see that huge uh, double moral, double standards for many uh, uh, that we are suffering. Because in one hand, you see these immigrants and communities of color working for white folks uh, in in farms, in different enterprises, but at the same time, they are not willing to stand up and defend their own workers. And we see how they sell us, no? If they, they throw us under the bus, it doesn't matter. Uh, but I think that um, um, the change is coming. I feel it. Uh, I think that most than ever, uh, uh, we are being embraced and we are embracing others as a, 
United uh, Movement. Uh, and I believe in the power of people as the only one uh, not to take revenge, but also to be included as the others and the same importance as the other. Uh, because what I have here and I repeat all the time is that we shouldn't be doing uh, that o things that others are doing to us. So we need to figure out how to work together. But I do think that it's a lot of position in terms of the change, but the change is coming and will arrive. And I'm glad to be here. I'll also add, um, when we're looking at kind of interconnections, right, like the, when you look at the Georgia legislature, you know, the same legislators who are proposing, you know, anti-LGBTQ bills are the same ones who are proposing, um, you know, anti-women bills and more policing and anti-immigrant bills. So these issues are all interrelated. Um, and, and we need to fight all forms of white supremacy and have solidarity with each issue. Thank you both. Do any of our attendees have questions they want to ask our, our panelists? I have a question, if you guys can hear me. Yes. Okay. Um, I know you, this is kind of going off what you were just speaking about, and you guys already spoke about like your role with community organizers, but especially in the time we're in, I'm wondering what you guys think is the role of like lawyers or the legal field within community organizing, and like how we like can use this tool that we have the privilege to have to go in and be effective, but not tell them what to do, but be effective and use this tool with those who are already doing the work on the ground? Great question. I'd be happy to jump on that. Um, no, that's so huge. Um, I think movement lawyering is so, so, so important, especially in this time that, you know, I think, unfortunately, lawyers have a tendency of taking over and, and then, you know, having the, the limelight be on them and, and it's just not the right way to do it. I think it's so important to organize um, or rather follow the lead of community organizing. Um, that, in my opinion, is your role, really to support the people on the ground, the people who are doing the work, who know the community inside and out. It is our job to um, follow their leadership um, and, and, and respect that and, and do what they want us to do. Um, and so I know for Project South, um, we've been able to pass along with GLAR and many other community organizations, non-detainer policies. And we've only been able to do that by following the leadership of community leaders and organizers. I personally, um, I think that at that has been very difficult sometimes to build. Um, I think that uh, the challenge is that, no? to find ways, uh, new tactics uh, to fight back. And uh, the traditional lawyers sometimes doesn't want to work with us. Uh, sometimes, many times, they don't want to hear about a, I don't know, like a, doing a petition, making noise, moving the social media. They think it's better to to be quiet uh, because whatever is the reason. But sometimes I think that many, as, as Priyanka mentioned, many of our uh, successes are uh, have been because we have combined this uh, community lawyering and the community organizing. And that makes a stronger uh, the legal aspect, but also the community aspect as well. You know, um, it's not easy. It's not easy uh, as we have faced, for example, many years ago, people, lawyers used to tell us, no, 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 I, you know, I spent so many, I don't know how many thousands of dollars learning, you know, uh, I am paying to school. I don't know how many tuition thingies, you know, it's like a, you guys shouldn't 
But the matter is that in 2007, when we start uh, working on the 287G and trying to stop it, uh, the, in the state of Georgia, used to be like uh, five or seven lawyers on immigration. And we needed to learn the intersection between in, uh, criminal law and the immigration law. So we have to develop these things. Uh, and sometimes that creates a, 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 like a struggle with the lawyers because the lawyers, sometimes they don't want to explain to the people like a basic words and we have to explain and the lawyers call us and tell us, you know, you are not lawyers and we are like, okay, but you should do your work instead of, you know, um, or take another approach. The other concern, uh, why we like community lawyer, lawyering because I think it allow us to see the community organizing not as a second level work. It puts on the, on the table at the same level other type of work, like be, being a lawyer. It's another level of interaction that could help and could make it stronger or more powerful, whatever is your tactic that you are applying. And I think it's important um, because sometimes we have this classicist um, vision of why I'm a lawyer, you are not, Do you know? It's, um, but I think that if we challenge that and try to combine, you know, and to share strategies and tactics, I think that that will, it has the potentially opening, you know, another, another concept on how we can fight together for social justice. Thank you both. I think that's so critical for um, folks, you know, joining our call today and listening in um, the kind of elitism that takes place in in the legal field um, and, you know, creating an equal playing field and really in movement lawyering, listening to the folks on the ground that are impacted um, and following their lead and, and asking what are the ways that um, you can Use your use your legal knowledge um, to kind of amplify the voices of of the communities on the ground, whether that's know your rights presentations or um, signing petitions and and doing non legal work um, yeah. and being a part of that movement. I think that's so critical. Yes, um, I do see we're at we're at noon. Um, so I wanted to um, thank both of our speakers for, for today. Um, we have recorded this and I'm hoping um, with the series we can have like a YouTube channel or something like that for folks to join in. Um, I did want to plug um, the, the, the rest of the series that we have this week tomorrow at 10. We have Christina Ituralde Thomas from Kind speaking about representing unaccompanied minors. Um, we're seeing a huge influx at Tahare, um, and I know across the across the country of unaccompanied children because of the the MPP policy, and they they're the only folks that are being able to cross the border. So we're seeing a lot of um, young people coming into the country in need of in need of relief. And then um, that's at 10 tomorrow on the same link. And then in the afternoon we have uh, Lorelai Williams from SPLC, who's going to be talking about a trauma. Um, race equity informed approach to doing this work, which is, you know, very similar to, um, you know, Priyanka and uh, Adelina both kind of talked about that in, in, in this work. So um, I want to thank both of you for, for taking the time to be with us today. I want to thank everyone that, that joined in. And, you know, I'm, I'm really um, grateful to be a part of this community um, and to be in partnership with both of you. And, um, you know, Tahare Atlanta really appreciates um, being in solidarity with both of your organizations. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beth.